Hey everyone, what's up? This is the seventh episode of Pure Grade Pro Res, and today, as you can tell from the title, I'm going to be reviewing the two New Beginning in Sapporo shows from New Japan. Now, first of all, this is going to be the little, uh, what do you call it, house cleaning section at the start of the episode, so maybe like skip ahead two minutes if you just want to get right into the review. Um, I just want to say, I promised you guys a New Beginning preview series, but... I obviously, as you can tell, didn't end up doing that. I just didn't have enough time. I was trying to get out some other episodes and watch some other shows. And uh, yeah, sorry about that. I do plan on doing a preview for the New Beginning in Osaka show. But for these shows, I was like, you know what? I'll just do a review and I'll, I'll just apologize at the start of the episode. And uh, hopefully the uh, the fans will forgive me. Now, uh, a, a quick little bit of background for these shows I didn't watch them in entirety now I know that's sacrilege I'm here I am professing that I'm going to be reviewing and analyzing these shows and I haven't watched them all the way from from start to finish now let's just be honest okay no one cares about the New Japan undercards like maybe there will be a few storyline elements that are developed like you know the sort of stuff with Tamatonga or even the stuff with um you know like Jay White and Okada and Tanahashi that sort of stuff but let's be honest, we're here for the upper card, you know, we're, we're here for the stuff that really comes in at the two hour mark. So um, look, please forgive me if I'm not going to give a very in-depth analysis of, uh, you know, Narita versus Yamura, you know. But uh, yeah, apart from that, let's just get right into the show. So we're going to be reviewing the first night now of the New Beginning in Sapporo show. This was uh, just like the second night, it was at the Hokkaido Prefectural Sports Centre, and this drew 4.8 thousand people, which I believe is a slightly lesser number then, uh, yeah, is that the right term? <laughs> it was slightly, yeah, yeah, it's a slightly smaller number than um, New, New Japan usually draws in this building. But you have to remember that there was no uh, big match on the show. There were a few singles matches, and obviously there was the mega powers of Tanahashi and Okada teaming up in the main event. But that's not, you know, that's not as juicy as having an IWGP heavyweight title match or a junior heavyweight title match on the show. So I think that's actually pretty impressive that they managed to draw that much. Oh, sorry, what, what is it with me in trying to um, use the term to define the, the numbers of people? Look, uh, what was I saying? It's good that they it's good that they managed to draw this many people, uh, this many fans, with a relatively lackluster card. But in the end, this actually ended up being a, a pretty good show overall. Um, the last three matches were all uh, pretty good, and uh, look, uh, as I said, I'm just going to run through this undercard because you know I don't have I don't have the time to just sit through and analyze the the Tenzon and Nakanishi tag matches. Okay, so let's get right into it. First match: Young Lions, Narita versus. Yuma. Mora. Look, I briefly, I briefly watched this. It has all the, um, you know, signature stuff you expect from the New Japan Young Lions. You know, a lot of, a lot of fire, a lot of energy. It's always cute because they're they're throwing out the weak moves. Um, Narita, he's been, he was one of my favorites alongside Amino from that batch of the Young Lions. It was Yagi that I believe recently left and. Um, I was glad that it wasn't Narita because he was always, he seemed to be one of the ones that was weaker and people weren't as high on, but I was high on him for a while and it, it, it's good to see that he's um, sticking around. And hey, in this match, um, he's been, apparently he's been pulling out a few um, finishes lately and here he finished Yamura with a belly to belly bridge suplex and he hit this beautifully. He threw Yamura into the ropes. As soon as he, uh, as soon as he uh, bounces off, he grabs him and just throws him right over his shoulders. He has a you know, beautiful bridge. Um, look, can't can't rate the match, but you know, I rate Narita, and I say, you know, Narita, you're doing well. Keep it up. Next match was Yamino and Yoshida, that young line team versus Hinare and Nakanishi. Again, I briefly watched this. Uh, the the few things I picked up. Um, you know, nice energy from Umino. He was also showing some really, uh, like, slick transitions into uh, some holds, specifically the arm bar, so I really like that. Um, there was a nice spear in Urinagi from Hanare to get the win. Side note, um, Hanare, he's a, he's a fellow Kiwi, just like me. Um, his name is, like, I'm, I'm not sure if people actually know this, his name is actually Aaron Henry. You know, you know his his um his uh his work name is Toa Hanare, but the Hanare thing that came from just the Japanese pronunciation of Henry. So his name is literally Henry, but uh, yeah, just ran a little note there. Um, Nakanishi was fine. People, you know, the crowd finds it cute how like he's so slow and lumbering. Um, he, he is he is just a true veteran. He's he's probably the most broken down of all the wrestlers on the roster. Oh, no, actually, there's Azuka, isn't there? But Azuka's going to be leaving soon. So, yeah, Nakanishi, most broken down. Um, young lines were good. Um, there's actually a, a strong contingent of people who've not really been, I wouldn't say turning on Yoshida, but they've been, like, looking at the people who are really pro Yoshida, like the the random indie pro res fans who watch K-Dojo, and they've been like, huh, yeah, this Yoshida kid, he's good, but I don't think he's world-class and a future star, as everyone else seems to say. And I'm sort of in that train, like, that, that train I'm in that group you know I'm on that train I, I think you know he's impressive but I'm not seeing um the sort of energy and passion and uh you know de uh, attention to detail that I'm seeing with like Amino and Narita 
So yeah, those are my little opinions there. Again, can't rate the match. Who cares? This is you know this is probably you know f- uh, you know a three star. You know, give it the gentleman's three stars as uh, has become popular to do. Next match was Azuka and Taka versus Tenzon and Tiger Mask Four. Again, I briefly watched this. It seemed pretty dull. I was skipping ahead. The fans were sort of they were reacting to the big spots, but you could tell throughout they were sort of just being polite and you know giving these um these veterans the time. You know, giving you know giving them that respect. Um, it actually ended in DQ. Uh, if I if I remember correctly, Azuka, I believe he got out the chair and he used it on, I believe, Tiger Mask when he went to the top rope. And um, that would actually end up playing into the, well, I guess sort of, um, what would you call it? It would be um, foreshadowing for um, the what would happen in the main event of Night 2. So, uh, yeah, there was that. Again, like, these first four matches, um, very skippable. You know, no, nothing nothing super, uh, super special. Next match, we had, uh, what was it? Honma, Makabe, Yoshihashi... Yano and Taguchi versus the Bullet Club. I just watched the final five minutes of this. Um, what was surprising was this was we had we had the pairing of Taguchi versus uh, Ishimura here, but they didn't actually interact that much. Like as I was going through the match, I was skipping. To be fair, I was skipping every five seconds ahead on the New Japan World Player trying to find their interactions because you know I want to follow that story. But I think I only remember their one interaction being when Taguchi hit a cross body splash from the ropes to the outside on Ishimura at the very end. Um, Tamatonga, he's he's still playing up that this good guy character, and it's funny because when we first saw that, we all thought, oh yeah, this is just going to be uh, like a one match gimmick where he's going to be like, hey, I'm a good guy, I'm a good guy, and then he 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 pretends being good, and then it's revealed to all be, oh, it was all a joke. He's just using it to get the upper hand, but he's been playing this consistently, and I do like this idea of giving Tamatonga just this totally out there gimmick, you know, totally uh, different to everything else, like every other way he's portrayed himself thus far in New Japan. But my my one issue is that he repeats the same dialogue and the same sort of delivery. Like he's always saying, oh, come on. And he's always doing that high pitched squeal. And to be fair, the audience always like laughs whenever he does that. But whenever he's saying just saying the same things over and over in the exact same way, I guess ironically, as I'm doing now, as I'm just repeating my point. But whenever he does that, it just comes off as um, uncreative and it's just a bit annoying. It's like, yeah, Tamatonga, we get it. You can say, you can know, you can do the same few things. Can you give us anything different with this character? And I have no idea where this character is even going. Like, I wonder if it's going to lead up with um, Tamatonga being kicked out of the Bullet Club, because you can already see whenever Tamatonga teams with the rest of uh, the Bullet Club, they always get pissed off at him, you know, joking about and everything. So I wonder if Jay White, you know, the cutthroat era, I wonder if he's going to, like, kick out Tamatonga, but then maybe that's going to lead the Bullet Club OGs, like, um, not really Yujiro, because he joined later, but he's been he's been around for long enough, like, at least four years. Surely he counts as an OG at this point. You know, what's the difference between, like, one or two years at this point when he's been there for, like, five years? So maybe Yujiro and Fale will end up sort of leaving or, like, turning on Jay because they'll be like, hey, Tamatonga was one of our boys. He's been with us since the beginning and now you're kicking him out. Um, but hey, we've already done one Bullet Club Civil War angle and that lasted way too long and didn't have a satisfying um, payoff. So hey, maybe we don't do another one. Who knows what's happening with this idea? Um, anyways, this was another fine match. Um, I, I'm pretty sure Yano got like a, a shitty um, like low blow roll up finish. Who really cares about that? Again, look, I know you guys are coming to this podcast with the greatest analysis possible, which is, hey, hey that's what I'm giving you, okay? This is the, this is the uh, analysis that these matches deserve, okay? I've seen these matches, the, these pairings, these matchups for so many years that I'm just totally, totally bored of it. Um, luckily, we're, we're just starting. We're almost into the, to the interesting stuff. So next, we had an LIJ versus Suzuki-gun six-man tag match. Um, this was Desperado, Taichi, and Kanemaru versus Bushi, Shingo, and Naito. Um, now, if this was if this was like a match positioned on like the main event or like a Korokin show or something, I can't imagine in what situation it would be. You know, there's only like well, I guess the only real star there is Naito. Everyone else is sort of like C grade. Not in my opinions of them, obviously, but um, they're like at least C or D grade in terms of how important New Japan obviously considers them to be. But this would probably be a great match in that scenario. But since this was you know um, right in the middle of this card, it only it only ended up going 13 minutes apparently, according to Cage Match. Um, it was fine. You know we got some more teasers of t- um, Taichi and Naito interacting. I really liked at the start they were both sort of playing cool because obviously they like they they both have heel gimmicks. Naito's is like, you know, oh, I don't care, I'm going to piss about, and that's sort of what Tai Chi does, but he does it in a more sort of diabolical way, you know, like, they're both known as, known as being time wasters, but 
Naito is the one who's, you know, doing the poses and everything and, um, you know, just like fluffing about. Well, Taichi's the one who's more likely to, I think I'd say Taichi is more likely to start a brawl as a means to waste time, whereas Naito is the one who's just going to lie in the ring, you know? So um, that was fine. We got the, you know, fine, usual Ally J and Suzuki-gun uh, junior exchanges. Um, that was okay. We had, you know, Taichi finish the match. He obviously, look, look, this is a match between Desperado, Taichi, and Kanemaru versus Shingo, Naito, and Bushi. Now, who of these six wrestlers do you think is going to take the fall? Of course, it's going to be fucking Bushi because he always takes the fall in tag matches. It's actually so annoying. Like, I already am not super impressed with Bushi, but now this factor that's obviously against his will, being booked to always take the fall, it actually makes me dislike him even more because it's like, yes, I know if you're going to be in the match that you're going to be the one eating the fall, and that annoys me, so I, I dislike you slightly even, slightly, even slightly more. But um, yeah, so Taichi, he hit the dangerous backdrop, which is basically um, a move that he he took from his master, Kawada. Hit that on Bushi, he got the win. Um, I'm pretty sure he administered a beatdown to Naito in the in the post-match. I'm pretty sure Kanemaru and Desperado were sort of um, working over Naito, and, and Taichi was sort of posing in the ring, sort of um, parroting the Ally J Destino pose that Naito does, you know, lying down, sort of mocking him for that. Um, yeah, that, you know, fine match. Again, I've seen these Suzuki-gun Ally J matches so many times that I just lose interest. Um, again, like, I'm not saying it was a bad match. It was probably like a three-star. Again, I didn't watch the entire thing. This was when I actually played the entire length of, but I just was sort of focusing on work and, you know, in the other half of my computer screen that I, you know, divided. Anyways, let's get into the next match. This is where the show became worthwhile. And again, not saying anything up to here was outright bad, but it was just totally skippable. So, Sonata versus Suzuki. This was a very fun grappling exchange, you know, because you've obviously got Suzuki, you know, MMA um, background with Pancrase and everything, and Sonata, he's known as being the guy who goes for submission holds and grappling. They don't always play that off. Like, it's more like something he'll bring out at certain points in a match, but they usually play off him having, like, a very impressive uh, level of general athleticism and not really acrobatics. And, you know, like, when I say, like, he's not like... Um, um, ricochet or an osprey but you know he's got some decent you know movement off the ropes so uh, yeah this being ended up being a really fun match at the start uh suzuki he's escaping all of sonata's holds because the idea is you know sonata's only like what 30 and i believe suzuki's pushing 50 and so it's playing off the idea of oh here's this young you know blonde haired you know um stoic grappler he thinks he's so cool but then there's this veteran you know suzuki a total killer he can you know just avoid and outsmart all the all this guy's um you know lame grappler attempts because he's the king of grappling um, so I really enjoyed that. There was actually one moment where Sonata he'd, he'd tried to lock in the he tried to lock in the Paradise Lock and he failed. But the second time he tried it, he actually got it. And I was expecting Suzuki to break out from it at any moment, but he stood in there and um, you know Sonata had to come off the ropes and drop drop kick him and um, use the impact of the drop kick to knock him out of it. And after that, Suzuki, what you could tell he was embarrassed because as soon as he got back to his feet, he just ran at Sonata and started throwing strikes as if you like you fucking son of a bitch, you dare embarrass me in front of a New Japan crowd with grappling, you dare put me in such an embarrassing hold, you know. So I thought that was a, a cool little moment. Um, I I didn't enjoy what followed next because hey, it's Minoru Suzuki. It's the current year. What are we gonna get? We're going to get an arena brawl, and this I'm so fucking over the arena brawl. Like it, I can imagine back in the day before this was such a staple in uh, Japanese wrestling and pro rest that that was actually a cool thing where it's like holy shit you know the audience is like wow we paid for these tickets and now here are the wrestlers that we wanted to see and they're brawling right in front of us and they're they're grabbing um, like water bottles from fellow fans and hitting them with it and they're even using the guardrail and using that as a weapon but yeah I just get it's 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 amazing that I can get more and more aggravated with the arena brawls despite them having been a consistent thing in new japan for the entirety that i've been watching since uh since what like 2015 and yeah i'm just like i i just end up skipping these like i will uh watch intermittently like every like 10 seconds to see if i'm missing anything interesting but nah it's just the usual you know suzuki working over sonata you know putting him in some few basic holds on the outside throwing him um into the guardrail or using the guardrail as a weapon or something um i wasn't really that into it one thing that was really cool was obviously there's a lot of criticism against Sonata for being so stoic and he comes off as almost non-human by the way he's constantly trying to play this cool character who's so calm and collected and oh look at his look at his frosted blonde hair and he's so smooth in the ring but because he's up against a killer like Suzuki he had to play he had to work from under and he really had to play the babyface role of someone who's up against you know a total monster and so that allowed him to actually sell a lot more and look he is a great babyface I didn't see much of him in 
what was it? Rest, I didn't see much of him in Wrestle 1, and I think he also wrestled in Big Japan. I didn't see much of him then, but that was when he was like a pure babyface before coming to New Japan and being the, you know, the sort of anti-hero heel, or like, I guess like a very minimal face, uh, like in the last few years. But here, Suzuki just brings out the best in him. You know, he's very emotive. You can see all the expressions on his face. Like, it's 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 almost jarring, and I, always, I know I always use that word, but it's basically, it's, it's really jarring seeing someone who's always just, you know, robotic face, and here you see Suzuki, you know, working over his limbs, you know, just striking him over and over in the face and you actually see wow Sonata actually can feel pain he actually you know does hurt so um yeah I enjoyed seeing that um these guys had some really impressive chemistry there was there was a, a sequence where they started both like trading their signature moves or at least trading counters and teasers of their signature moves I, I really enjoyed that um at one point uh Sonata, he went for his sort of, what do you call it, the Shiranui, the uh, slice bread number two setup for his dragon sleeper, but he did that without the rope where he just like did a backflip while holding um, Suzuki's neck and they, they sort of messed that up. Suzuki's never really good at those spots. Like, um, he's also not good with the reverse Frankensteiners or those sorts of moves where he has to be uh, immediately sort of acrobatic. Like, it doesn't matter what it is. If you need Suzuki to be slightly acrobatic, if he has to take like a flip or something, or a tumble, he's usually going to look really awkward, because you have to remember, this guy is 49, body's probably quite broken down from MMA, as well as obviously wrestling, he can't do those spots with these um, younger guys like Omega and Naito, he can't keep up on a, on a similar level, so um, yeah, they sort of messed that up, but luckily it wasn't too bad, Sonata still managed to lock in the um, Dragon Sleeper afterwards, but it's a shame because the Dragon Sleeper still looks terrible, like I remember when he first brought that out, when he was like using, when he had a, a short, very short program with Okada, back when he first started in 2016, the Dragon Sleeper was really cool, but ever since then, I think this is a New Japan like um, management idea. They don't want Sonata to cover the opponent's neck, and I think that's because it covers um, the opponent's face, and then you can't see like the baby face who's likely in this hold. You can't see them selling, you know. You can't see them scrunching up their face or screaming out, and so they have to have him just like grab like the, the basically like the hairline of the head, and it just doesn't look painful at all. Like it's like Suzuki, literally just crane your neck slightly forward or just move your body slightly down, and you're out of the hold. I'm at least glad he doesn't use Sonata doesn't use the Dragon Sleeper as a finishing hold anymore. He's moved over to using that um that great rounding rounding moon salt, which is um I, he he try, I think he I was gonna say he used that in this match, but obviously if he did, then he would have won. And spoilers, he didn't win this. But um yeah, the Dragon Sleeper terrible you know need to get rid of it um there was a cool moment where Sonata tried to have a strike off with Suzuki where Suzuki obviously you know standing tall throwing those those open palm strikes all those very stiff um elbows and what was it, elbows forearms yeah same thing yeah elbows and forearms and I'm, I'm pretty sure it was this match I hope I'm not confusing it with the um tag match but Sonata tried throwing his own sort of elbows and he did sort of a Misawa-esque rolling elbow and um you know he was doing like the the three, four, five um, elbow combos. That was really cool. But obviously, Suzuki Suzuki, he's the guy with the actual striking experience. He just strikes Sonata down, you know, puts him right back in his place. Um, after a bunch of more, you know, really fun exchanges, both guys going back and forth, um, Suzuki got a really quick gotch pile driver and uh, put Sonata away, you know, got the win, which is surprising because usually the gotch pile driver, the idea is if Suzuki, like pretty much in all big Suzuki matches, he's going to tease the gotch pile driver and he'll hold the person up in the position um, for like what, maybe like five seconds, but um, here, he, he, there was no tease when he went for it, he just immediately picked Sonata up, you know, didn't, didn't do the whole, oh, I'm gonna show Boat about this, you know, gonna um, crack my neck, and then slowly reach over through the legs, he just picked him right up and put him right down, so yeah, this ended up being a really nicely worked match, very fun chemistry, I gave this three and a half stars, and hey, my first rating um, of the night, it took us one, two, three, four, what, one, two, three, four, five, it took us six matches to finally get a rating, but, um, yeah, um, this was, uh, it's difficult because all of the, apart from the main event of night two, which I thought was low-tier great match, um, all these other, um, like, upper card matches on these two shows, I thought were good, and I have a, I have a real hard time rating them, but, um, I really enjoyed this one, and I also really enjoyed the next match, which was Evil versus Zack Sabre Jr. If you listen to my last New Japan-related podcast, which was actually my first episode back at the start of January, the Wrestle Kingdom 13 review, you will know that I'm not the biggest fan of Zack Sabre Jr. I don't think he's terrible, I think he's good, but I think he can be bad, and I think he's great on his day when he's when he's in an appropriate match, but 
to, just to be brief so I can get past his next review this match, my issue with him is that he is way too protected. Um, and again, maybe you think that's good. Maybe you like how dominant he looks, but in a lot of matches where he gets 90% of the offense and pulls off all these crazy holds one after the other, it, he comes off like a like a spot monkey to me. And it, it's, I feel icky using that word because it's like, oh, what are you, a fucking um, you know, WWE fan from 2013 who's just discovered the indies and doesn't like that something's challenging his beloved WWE. But you know, he does come off like a spot monkey going from, oh, here's this crazy move where I'm going to you know stuff your arm down your throat and here's this other move where I'm going to shove your toe into your other toe or you know that sort of shit um that would just always annoy me but again as i've said he can have great matches and uh i'm not going to say this was a great match but this was another really good match so evil versus zack saber jr the story going into this was that zack had always been pinning evil whenever they were faced up against each other <laughs> sorry uh, uh, fucking hell did you notice that i tried to apologize for my mess up and then i said thoey god damn anyways um what was i saying Oh yeah, Zach, in, in a, a bunch of matches where he's paired up against Evil, he's always been the one to pin Evil and thus win uh, the match for his team. And it's usually always with one of those um, like clutch holds where he's holding the arms and he uses his legs over Evil's legs to hold them in the, in the pin position. So he's always done that. Um, this was also mentioned on the Road 2 shows. And I believe on one of them, they actually both eliminated each other when they're in a, a main event that was like in a... a, a you know, an elimination format, obviously, and I think they both went over the rope or something like that, and Kevin Kelly had pointed out how, you know, Zack Sabre Jr., he always beats Evil, and obviously, they were meant to have a singles match at King of Pro Wrestling last year, but then Jericho ran in, and he attacked Evil, and, you know, hey, that was, you know, I'm not sure if the run that Zack Sabre Jr. was on last year, I'm not sure if I would have really enjoyed a match versus Evil back then, I feel like he would have had more of his habits because that was basically his entire run last year, was just dominate someone for 90% of the match and then either randomly lose or just boringly continue that dominance and win. Anyways, that's enough of me complaining. Um, this match ended up being good because what was different was, as you can probably tell by my criticisms of what I consider to be a bad Zack Sabre Jr. match, here he was not allowed to be super dominant. Evil actually got to... I'd say dominate Zack Sabre Jr. for like the first five minutes because obviously, and this again, this relates to another issue I have with Zack Sabre Jr., he's very skinny and very flimsy. I was looking on Cage Match and it said that he weighs 85 kgs. And like, I know that on the screen, like when I'm watching him, maybe he actually, like maybe the muscle is actually hidden. You know how they say that the camera adds like 10 pounds, there's usually like women saying that, I, 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 I seem, seem to find, you know, because that's more, I guess the weight's more of an issue for women, but with, with guys, I feel like it's probably similar where the screen takes away, you know, like 10 pounds, like of muscle mass, obviously, because he just looks super skinny, but this relates to my point, because Evil, he's a, he's a very beefy dude, you know, he's probably well over 100 kgs, surely, yeah, I mean, he must be over 100 kgs, and he was not allowing these flimsy wrists of Zack Sabre Jr. and, you know, these weak little frail hands, he was not allowing them to turn his, you know, his massive, you know, like, um, meatloaf arms, like, around. Evil just dominating, just dominated him, like, controlling him, be like, no, you're not gonna, you're not gonna twist me into, into places, I'm actually going to, you know, put you in holds, and you're not gonna be able to escape. So, I really enjoyed that, and that was sort of the format that this match followed, because Sabre, even though he was able to get in control eventually, like, he was able to use his sort of, um, technical wizardry to sort of escape some holds, and, you know, do some damage with some strikes, and eventually that allowed him to fight finally bring out his holds, it never felt overkill. Like, there were moments where Evil was dominating, and there were moments when uh, Sabre was dominating. What was funny for me was, like, why don't other heavyweights just do this when they're up against Sabre? Because Evil, he showed, oh yeah, he's a big dude, he can allow this, he can stop this skinny guy from just, you know, contorting him in all these holds. Why don't the others do that? Why doesn't Ishu, who's, you know, got a lower center of gravity, who's probably got an easier time, um, keeping his limbs to himself, you know, you know, knocking Zack Sabre Jr. off of him, why don't they just do that? Like, same with Okada. Okada must weigh, like, I don't know, because he's, like, he's not, like, super muscular, but he's, like, six foot three, and it's, you'll be surprised how much those extra inches of height end up correlating to in terms of um, weight. So, surely, even he should have an easy time shaking off Zack Sabre Jr. So, it's funny, because I enjoyed that aspect of it, where it was like, wow, this makes sense, Evil's a big dude, he can't easily be contorted, but then it just makes me criticize all the other Zack Sabre Jr. matches when he's, when he's already dominated these other heavyweights. But, um, you know, anyways, it was fun watching Evil just maintain control. Um, once Sabre, as I said, once he brought out his more complex holds, it felt fine. I was actually able to enjoy them and appreciate the technique of all of his, you know, his, his smooth transitions to and from moves, because, um, not only was he, uh, you know, not 
you know, pulling off like five moves every five seconds. He had also shown to be injured by some of Evil's work. And I think he ended up, I'm not sure if it was from those holds, but at some point in the match, Evil started working over Sabre's hand and Sabre had to like take off his wrist tape. And you could see that Sabre was really struggling to apply those holds. And so that was another aspect that I really liked. And I know that that's a very basic story that happens with Zach when he's um, made to work from under in a match where it's like, like it was like in his um, Okada match, uh, the title match for the title in what was it, Sakura Genesis last year, where his arm had been worked over to the point where he couldn't apply his holds with the same amount of, you know, strength to, you know, pull pull or push or whatever. So, yeah, I, I enjoyed that. I'm still not a fan of how flimsy and sort of frail Sabre looks when he's selling for someone's, like, strikes and power moves because Evil, he starts bringing up, you know, bringing up his big power moves in those, like, pretty, pretty beastly strikes. And it's annoying because Evil's own offense itself looked really cool but then you see Saber and he like he just has a very odd way of selling I think I described it in my Wrestle Kingdom 13 review as like a like a test or like a test wrestling dummy that's been crossed with something else I can't remember what I said but he just looks really stiff when he sells and he just he almost comes off as comical and I've seen people say that they like that because it's like oh here's this guy who's a technical wizard who can pull off all these crazy holds but at heart he's a weak boy but I don't like that because to me that just comes off as a contradiction where it's like oh so you can totally turn someone into a pretzel but then if they strike you you look like um like a piece of like a plastic bl like bag in the wind that just like being flown you know being blown away but yeah, it feels like I'm, I, I guess I just get really riled up with Sabre matches because everyone goes on about how great he is and, you know, they say how unique he is. And I will agree that he's unique. Like, even if I didn't at all like um, like him, I would still appreciate the difference in style he brings to the matches. But I just think that he's so overrated. But again, um, why do I always end up doing this? Always end up criticizing someone when they actually have a good match. But look, this ended up being a good match. Um, there are a bunch of, just like in the uh, Sonata versus Suzuki match, there are a bunch of great, you know, like very strong chemistry as a, you know, trading signature moves back and forth and teasers. And um, obviously Sabre, because he's pinned Evil with so many sort of roll-up cradle pins, he teased a few of those. And Evil tried going for like four... Um, Everything, everything is evils, um, the STO, and on the fifth, he finally got it, and uh, yeah, so he finally breaks his duck, he finally puts Zack Sabre Jr. away, um, you know, good match, uh, I, I'm not sure if I enjoyed this more than Suzuki versus Sonata, because they're sort of different, where, like, the story here was that Evil was going to establish dominance right away, whereas in the in Sonata versus Suzuki, it was more like Sonata was always working from the bottom, he was getting a few glimpses, he was getting a few hope spots, so, yeah, because that, that match felt much more like maybe 70% Suzuki, 30% Sonata, and this one felt like, I'd say, maybe even, maybe just 60% Evil, 40% uh, Saber. I get, I'm just getting, what, what's the point of me doing these percentages? Like, oh, this felt, you know, 10% more than X and 7% more than Y. Look, you guys don't care about the percentage, percentage ratings. Let me just give you what you want. You want the star rating? This was another three and a half star match. And now we come to the main event, which was Okada and Tanahashi, uh, which I believe I've just seen Western fans refer to as the Mega Powers, obviously referencing, what is it? It's um, Hogan and Randy Savage, isn't it? I'm not a guy from the um, 80s and 90s, so I'm not, I'm not super familiar with that. But yeah, you got the Mega Powers versus Jay White and Farley. And interesting little fact that White pointed out at the end of the match, this is the first New Japan main event main event, sorry, the first New Japan show main evented by two New Zealanders, White and Farley, so the, that's pretty cool, you know, I'm a fellow New Zealander, fellow Kiwi, I appreciate that sort of stuff, um, so the real appeal to this match, like, I'm not going to say this was a very well-worked match, what I enjoyed about this match was just the spectacle of seeing Okada and Tanahashi team together, now, obviously, they team together quite a lot in December and January leading up to these shows, but that was always in multi-man tags. Here, it was just them, you know. If Okada wants to tag out, he has to tag Tanahashi. If Tanahashi wants to tag out, has to tag Okada. If they want to execute a tag team move, they have to do it with each other. And I just, I guess this is sort of just a very sort of fan service match, at least to, to me, because... Like, I won't say that their tag team moves are, you know, super impressive, and I don't even think they have very good chemistry, but it's just... It's just the awe of seeing, wow, these two guys from one of the most legendary rivalries ever, my favorite series of matches ever, at least arguably, and yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, I'd say arguably, you know, my favorite match ever between them at uh, Wrestle Kingdom 10, and here they're finally teaming together, working together, it was just so awesome to behold, and you've got the perfect heel in Jay White, and also a good heel in Farley, but Farley, he sort of gets real heat just because he's so 
slow you know he's he's the, he's the definition of a role wrestler where it's like you're not here to um be a good wrestler you're here to play a role that's going to work into a story and uh jay white he's a he's a great genuine heel because he's a good wrestler but also gets really strong heat for just genuinely pissing off the crowd so that was a good counter to the these total stars of okada and tanahashi Another thing I really enjoyed about this match was just Jay White's performance in general. I'm not even directly just talking about his wrestling skill itself, like pure in-ring, because we do know that he obviously always holds back on the in-ring because, like, we've seen glimpses of him being great. You know, he has some great power moves in him, you know, some great suplexes and everything. And obviously there's that, um, what was it? There was a video by a dude called Forrest Sawa or something like that. I know that his, his Twitter name is, like, Jay White Supremacist. So um, that's whenever I think of him, I always think of the Jay White Supremacist guy. Um, he, he released a video which was called Jay White Changed the World, and he sort of an analyzes the psychology behind a lot of Jay White's moves. And some of the stuff I'd already picked up, and I was like, yeah, obviously, what are you doing just pointing out this obvious stuff? But then there were other moments where I was like, wow, I didn't even pick up on that. So, um, yeah, shout out to that that guy in that video. Um, go check that out. So we already, what my point being there, not just to give a random shout out to a dude, he didn't even earn it. You know, he didn't even pay me for that shout out. You know, that's how much I really respect him and his work. I, again, I've lost my point because I went on a little... Um, uh, intentionally comedic rant, which probably wasn't that funny. What was my point? I've totally lost it. Oh yeah, Jay White. Wrestling school, very good, but his actual uh, level as a performer is even better because he ha he is a heel down to a T. You know, he is great at just getting under the under the fan skin. You know, he appeals to them. You know, puts his hands up in the air. You know, being like, oh look at me, look how great I am. Even though I know you fans think I'm a piece of shit, but you guys should think I'm great. You know, he's just got you know a great level of narcissism in him. Um, he he really comes across as someone who's in love with himself. And maybe it's just me because even though I'm a Kiwi, I'm not used to hearing the Kiwi accent on TV because obviously I've grown up with mostly Western media from you know the US and the UK so whenever I hear a Kiwi voice especially sort of nasally in the way that Jay White's voice is although I guess all New Zealanders are probably nasally to be fair um, that also adds to his heel sort of persona because it just sounds like such a whiny voice you know because he gave a promo at the end of the match and um, you know he, he basically sounds like he's bragging but like complaining at the same time he's just a great heel he's definitely he's definitely the number one heel in New Japan right now like it's not a contest like there are general like good heels in terms of in ring I guess like Suzuki who's going to be like he's more of like an aggressive fighter heel where it's, where it's like he's not really cheating he's just being overly aggressive but Jay White he's actually a good heel and as I already mentioned paired up with you know the mega stars he's paired up against sorry the mega stars of Okada and Tanahashi he just gets great great heat from them as well because they're you know some of the best you know most popular wrestlers in the company so you know works over them gets head onto him you know it, it's great um Farley was okay as I said he was a he was a role wrestler here I did like some of his interactions specifically with Okada it's funny because Okada always pulls off like he always gets really acrobatic when it's against Farley and I feel like New Japan or at least maybe it's him I was gonna say New Japan push him to do this but maybe it's generally just him maybe his idea is that even though him and Fale are quite similar heights, um, they really want to play up Fale being the monster that Okada must overcome. So Okada sort of brings out more acrobatics. Like, I'm pretty sure there was one match they had. It might have been their 2017 match at Dontaku, I think. Or maybe it was a singles match they had in 2016, where Okada, he did like a sort of a flip off the ropes while holding Fale's wrist, I believe. And then he had a Rainmaker, you know, like a half Rainmaker off that. Like one without the actual um, ripcord thing. I feel like I'm remembering that. I hope I didn't make that up in my head because that'd be embarrassing. But it was such a cool spot. And here there was a moment where he flipped right over Fale. Like if um, like Fale bent down and Okada flipped right over his back. And Okada had great form. Like so, some people don't realize Okada he he trained with Toriyamon, You know, or was it actually Dragon Gate at the time? Sorry, he trained with yeah, it was 2005 I believe. So he trained with um Dragon Gate. So he actually is quite well versed in lucha. But he just never brings it up because that's just not the style he's developed. But um, even though I'm not super high on Fale as a wrestler, I always enjoy whenever Okada ends up working with him. And I guess that's the direction we're going because he's got a singles match against Fale in Osaka. And I won't say too much about that because I'm going to do, as I said, I'm going to do a preview for that uh, entire show. So I'm not going to give my thoughts on that. But I really, my point being, I really enjoyed their interactions here. Uh, um, Okada has fantastic selling. He's probably, in terms of like, like real-time selling, as in, looking at their expressions, how they're portraying their pain and, and you know, right there at that second, he's one, he's my favorite, you know, he's a wrestler, he's my favorite wrestler, you know, I think he is genuinely the greatest wrestler of all time, and I know it's, it's coming from a guy who's been res watching wrestling for like five years, you know, but I, you know, I've been watching all the greats that I can, and he just, you know, he just connects with me on an emotional level, he's one of those wrestlers where I'm actually invested in their story, you know, like with um, Naito, it's like, damn, I really want Naito to achieve this, but with Okada, it's like, 
well, if he doesn't achieve this, I'm going to be heartbroken and this is going to bring me down for like a few days where I'm genuinely going to go about my life and be sort of depressed if he doesn't um, achieve everything that he's trying to achieve. So yeah, um, again, Okada's selling was great. It just added more to Fale's um, otherwise limited offense. So I really enjoyed that. The match ended up having some interference at the end, but I actually thought it worked well because Ghetto, again, he's always interfering in these matches. He's always being like, you know, oh, Jay White, he's the best in the world. But if he can't get it done for whatever reason, I'm going to get in the ring and try pick a fight. And Tanahashi knocks him clean, like right out. And Ghetto does like a great bump where he goes totally stiff and falls back. Um, that was great. But then Jay White, he'd been working over Tanahashi's leg the entire match, and then he introduced a chair, and he started working over Tana's leg with that, and then he locked in this hold, which I believe I saw online is called the Tap Out Tanahashi, so the Tap Out, so the T-O-T, or is it Tap Tanahashi Out, the T-T-O, either way, he used that hold, it's basically an inverted figure four, it's a really cool lock, it looks, it looks way easier to apply than the figure four hold itself, Actually, no, I take that back. It just looks cooler in general than the figure four hold itself. Like, it's way more difficult to fuck that up. Like, I, for some reason, I notice a lot of Japanese guys, whenever they try to use the figure four, they end up not putting the second leg far enough across the person's first leg, and they end up making it look really awkward. But with this move, well, my point there was, this move looks pretty impossible to actually fuck up, just by the way the legs are arranged. And, um, yeah, they ended up tapping Tanahashi out. You know, Fale, or maybe it was Ghetto, they're holding Okada on the ropes, and... Tanahashi was in the hold for quite a while and ends up tapping out. So obviously, um, first of all, good match. I gave this between three and a quarter to three and a half stars. I didn't enjoy it as much as the other two singles matches, but it was very good. You know, most of that rating comes from just the awesomeness of seeing Tanahashi and Okada, which might not appeal to a lot of people. But um, yeah, but anyways, my point was obviously the mat, the story going into the Osaka main event between Tanahashi and Jay White is going to be Jay working over Tanahashi's leg. So you're going to have that. I'm pretty sure, I feel like that was the story in their, in their Wrestle Kingdom 12 match as well, I think. Because I remember when Jay White um, appeared at Power Struggle, he, I remember him doing a sort of dragon screw-like move on Tanahashi's leg. So, but I can't remember the Wrestle Kingdom match at all. I just remember it being, obviously like everyone, I remember it being super disappointing. But um, yeah, I can't remember. So, uh, not that it's a big issue, you know, hey, if you've done one match where it's leg focused on one guy, it doesn't matter if you do another one, like look at Okada and Tanahashi, they've done like four of them alone, but um, yeah, so this match did a good job at building up that excitement uh, for that match, again, I'm not going to go into my opinions or what I actually think is going to happen between them and their singles match, I'm going to save that for the uh, Osaka preview, but let's go on to the second night of the New Beginning in Sapporo shows, this one, I, I'll just check my notes, yeah, this one drew 6,000 fans, so up well over 1,000 fans from the previous day, and that's, that's way better, because if you look at some of their shows in this building, in the Hokkaido Prefectural Sports Center, they were getting, like, around 5,000 fans on, like, their, like, their usual, like, mid-level shows I think for the G1s they were getting quite a bit more but this is a really decent number like compared to last year which was headlined by Omega versus White that got just over 5,000 so here you've got this uh, headlined by Naito versus Taichi um, you know 6,000 flat well a few over 6,089 6, if I can get my fucking words out that's a good number for this you know and it's good that they were able to get um, you know like a good number on the first night and then like a very good number here so again Th this show, I actually didn't watch the first three matches. Now, that's even worse. Like, if you were thinking, oh, God, Lewis, you're reviewing the first night of the New Beginning in Sapporo shows, and you just totally skipped over the first five matches, gave very brief analyses, and didn't even give them star ratings, then you're going to hate me because, yeah, I didn't watch these, at least these first three, if I'm just looking at my notes, yeah, these first three matches, didn't watch them at all. Um, you know, fucking sue me. Let's just go through them. Toa Hanare defeated Yoda Suji. Um, this is probably a decent match. It was only seven minutes. The young lines always work well, especially when the time limit's lower. Like the longer a, a young line match goes, even though their time limits are only like what, 15 minutes, I think is what qualifies in New Japan as a, as a time limit draw for the, their division. But when they, whenever they keep them shorter, they're usually, um, more fiery, but what am I doing? I'm reviewing, I'm imagining what a match, what sort of, what happened in a match, and then I'm reviewing that. I'm not going to do that. There was also Nakanishi and Tiger Mask defeating Yoshida and Amino. So that's a... I was going to say it's a replay from the first night, but um, no, that was Tiger Mask and Tenzon losing to Azuka and Taka. But um, hey, look, at least Tiger Mask got his win here. Because, now again, I haven't seen this match, but I know that this totally ended with Tiger Mask hitting a, I'm going to say a top rope Tiger driver 
on, let's say, Yoshida. I beat you. That's how this nine nine minute match ended. Okay, you can put money on that. Next match was Hiroshi Tenzon versus Taka Michinoku and Azuka. And as I look at my notes, once again, this apparently ended by DQ. So um, that's what happened in their first match, which was which was also which also involved Tenzon, but that was him and Tiger Mask, as I just said. So here was Tenzon and Narita who had to put up with Azuka's shenanigans. And um, again, this was all. I, look, again, haven't seen this match, but I can tell, just by context, Azuka would have done some stupid thing. Maybe this time, instead of the chair, he brought out the Iron Claw, which is actually just like some kitchen foil that he's wrapped around a glove. And he probably used that on, let's say, he probably used that on Narita, because there's more emotional appeal with attacking a young lion than, you know, sort of the veteran. Actually, is there, maybe the veteran, maybe there's more emotional appeal there, because that's the guy that everyone knows and loves. Either way, who cares? One of them got attacked, it ended in a DQ uh, victory for them because of Azuka's shenanigans. As I said, this will play into the main event. Let's move on. Now, this was the match that I did actually watch. This was, um, I, I call them Taguchi Japan, but it's actually um, Makabe Honma, Yano and Taguchi. So it's actually like great bash heel and then just Taguchi and Yano. They were up against the Bullet Club. So that's a team of Ishimori, Tamatonga, Tangaloa and uh, Yujiro Takahashi. Um, this was fine. There were some fun um, Taguchi versus Ishimori interaction teasers. The story that I noticed on the Row 2 shows and also on, um, I think in, in this match as well, or maybe I was just like, confusing that with a Row 2 tag match I saw. Obviously the, the story in all of Taguchi's big um, title matches whenever he you know really gets them it's always going to be him working over the champion's ankle or leg because he has that what is it the oh my and garf ankuru but I, I think I, I heard Kevin Kelly calling it the oh my and gar ankle but then I, I was like wait but it's oh my and garf uncle isn't it because like Simon and garf uncle and garf ankuru which is like the sort of Japanese pronounce like pronunciation of ankle so whatever it's called anyways that's going to be the story going into the uh, junior heavyweight title match in Osaka. So I enjoyed their interactions. They they showed off some decent chemistry. And look, people beat this over the over the, over everyone else's heads where they say, look, Taguchi can have a great match when he's given the time. But we really, it, that is true. And we did see teasers of that. So I'm excited for that. Um, again, the only other thing of note here was Tama Tonga continuing the good boy shtick. And look, it's it's always funny for like the first, like, two minutes where you see him being all whingy and nasally and high pitch and be like, ah, oh, I'm sorry, you know, Honma, I'm sorry for hitting you. And then when his team gets angry at him and forces him to do like a, a big damaging move, he'll end up hurting himself in the process as if it's karma for him. It's like karma for him choosing to be a bad boy again. Again, I have no idea where the hell this is going. What are we doing with Tamatonga? Like it's in, like again, it's still interesting because he's getting something totally unique and it's fun to see him explore that, but I'm just getting annoyed with his delivery. Like, can you please not repeat the same lines and the same spots over and over again? Especially because this is like, like this is the same general crowd, you know, because you just did this the night before. Obviously, it's not going to be the exact same crowd. Probably some people chose one show over the other. But, you know, just, just give us some new stuff. That's all I'm saying. Next match was Bullet Club versus Okada, Tanahashi, and Yoshihashi. So we're back to the Mega Powers being in a multi-tag situation now this match was actually quite good i gave this three and a quarter stars um obviously we've got the the usual sort of okada and tanahashi team up moments which um i've already got on about in the main event from the previous show that was really good here um one thing i noticed was in the road two shows they were really building up okada and tanahashi being like wow these two legendary rivals they finally come together and they finally understand each other and respect each other and to me they're hitting that way too heavily on the head and it, it feels like to me this is going to lead to a blow off where i don't think it's going to be like one of them turning on each other but i think it's going to be where one of them's like you know what um i need to prove i'm better than you whether that's tanahashi who's still champion and he's like you know what i can't be champion until i've defeated my longest most important rival okada is as champion or it's going to be more likely i think okada being like you know hey i respect you tanahashi i've learned so much from you in these few months that we've been teaming together but my heart my heart like sorry my, my destiny god i'm being so pretentious playing the like role playing these fucking characters but you know i can imagine okada's like the general sentiment being you know my destiny is to be the face of new japan the iwgp heavyweight champion even though we're we're partners right now i need to challenge you so that's what i think is going to happen because they've been way too obvious that they're being friends I, it just to me that's wrestling 101 story you know it's going to be a big it's going to be you know so traumatic seeing the mega powers finally bust up and go one-on-one -on -one again but then we'll get another great match so you know who's really losing out there
so yeah, we had the the usual sort of decent exchanges you you expect from these guys. Um, again, Jay White was fun, you know, showing off his bravado, appealing to the fans, making himself the center of everyone's hate. One thing that was really interesting in this match, and what I didn't expect to make this like a like a like a really worthwhile undercard match, was Yoshihashi. And I, it's it's crazy because I sometimes think I'm the only one who actually respects Yoshihashi and realizes how how he's actually very good. Well, whereas people think he's like a five out of ten, I genuinely consider him to be like a seven out of ten. You know, like a high a high seven out of ten. And even I myself found myself second guessing him leading into this match, where I'm looking at this on paper and I'm like, huh, those extra two men on the either side of Okada and uh, Tanahashi versus. Um, what, Jay White and Fale, they're probably going to bring this match down. But Yoshihashi ended up having the best moments of this match. Like, first of all, there was a hilarious moment where, on the first night of the, just to explain, on the first night in the main event, there was a moment where Okada and Tanahashi, they very comedically, like, I think they'd just taken out Jay White, and they both faced each other, and they did, like, a sort of Hulk Up moment where they stared at each other and, like, screamed and got really, like, into each other, sort of hyping each other up. And here, Yoshihashi led that where, it was a moment where they all three of them had taken out one of them. I can't remember if it was Chase or Jay or Fale or whoever. They took them out, and then Yoshihashi looked at both Okada and Tanahashi, and he replicated their sort of hype-up scream from the previous night, but he just looked so awkward. And it was played off as a comedy spot, and the, and the crowd loved it. And the, the reactions from Okada and Tanahashi were great, because they were sort of just like, like, they weren't laughing, but you could, like, they were keeping a very straight face, but it's the kind of straight face where you can tell, like, you, like you look at Okada's face, and you're like, there is some laughter hiding behind there. And I don't even think that was like a character thing. I think that was just genuinely like Okada trying to hold hold back laughter seeing, you know, the, his geeky little friend Yoshihashi just scream with all of his heart while looking at both of them. And um in the in the finishing stretch, Yoshihashi ended up being the star because he was getting some really great hope spots against Jay White. Because this is playing off the story, um, and Jay White himself was re was referencing this throughout the match, either through dialogue or sort of just like some gestures which seem to be calling back to how Yoshihashi busted himself open and like got a concussion or something at the destruction show where he ran down to try save Okada and Tanahashi from Jay White and Ghetto. So Jay White was sort of being like, you know, hey, remember what happened last time when you tried to get me Yoshihashi? You know, you ended up bleeding and I, and I knocked you out with a chair. So there was some there was some history here in their in their interactions in the very um, final minutes. And I actually found myself like I'm so stupid. Obviously, I, I realize this in retrospective, but at the time, I actually found myself being like, "Wow, Yoshihashi is getting so many great near falls here, and he's executing so many great moves with like you know great technique. He's going to get a pin here." And obviously, I'm only thinking that for like a very split second, and then immediately afterwards, I'm like, "Nah, obviously, there's no way Yoshihashi is going to pin Jay White, especially leading into Jay White's title challenge." But look, Yoshihashi is actually he's like he's a he's a an average wrestler who can be great whereas you know like i'll say um zack saber jr is a good wrestler who can be bad or great yoshihashi is like a mediocre wrestler who can be great you know and that's just what i saw here he always he just like his gimmick is that he's like basically a bad wrestler that everyone forgets about him and that's what makes it so um impactful when he finally like lets out a big lariat or like an, a beastly power move and he reminds you he, he's like, hey, I know you guys think I'm fucking, I'm a bag of wet socks, but I can actually go, okay, respect me, and that's just what I love about Yoshihashi, he was just so good in those final few minutes, and um, obviously, he's the one who ends up being uh, tapped out here, uh, if, wait, if I, if I remember correctly, so yeah, I've just quickly checked the notes, and uh, you know, went to the New Japan site, and Yoshihashi was in fact the one who tapped out, it makes sense, you know, he's the guy who comes back in his return at New Year's Dash, it was New Year's Dash, wasn't it, and um, you know, he, he also gave a great performance then, and he was also the one who ended up eating the pin, and look, it was obvious, I should have known, why did I even question myself, why did I go back and bother checking the, the New Japan site, I, I would have been like 90% likely to get the right answer if I just said, yeah, Yoshihashi's in this match, he's probably taken the fall, and of course he did, he also submitted to Jay White's, now the New Japan site is saying it's a TTO, so that means it must be tap Tanahashi out as opposed to tap out Tanahashi, so again that's the inverted figure four, leg lock, and, sorry, leg lock, god what is it with me and slurring my words, 
uh, at least on this podcast. So um, yeah, this was a good match. Again, I generally enjoyed the, the Okada and Tanahashi interactions, as well as the general interactions between them and Jay, and to a lesser extent, um, Fale. And I, I didn't actually mention Chase, but look, Chase is like a solid all-rounder. I always, like, I think it's just his look that doesn't really appeal to me, because he just looks like such a low-grade indie wrestler. But he actually has, like, some very impressive athleticism to him, you know, um doesn't get gassed out i guess you know i mean like he can keep up um the the sequences you know the back and forth exchanges with everyone even though he doesn't look like the most fit person on the roster but um yeah decent match i gave this three and a quarter stars and now we're on to we're on the we're on the road to salvation boys boys and the few girls that probably maybe listen to the show because we've got um a series of three good matches just like on the first night so this first match here the first of the three matches that made the show worth watching was the junior heavyweight title tag title match between Shingo and, Bu- and Bushi versus Desperado and Kanemaru. So the story going in here was, it was a very convoluted story because it was like Rapongi 3K all fucking year. We think, okay, they're finally going to win back their titles. I never understood why they did their redemption arc at the start of the year where they won the titles back from the Bucks after losing them at Wrestle Kingdom. And ever since then, they've been constantly um, earning title shots and failing and earning title shots and failing. And then we thought they were finally going to be the ones to pin uh, Bush, uh, sorry, to pin Kanemaru and Desperado at Wrestle Kingdom. But then it ends up being Rapongi 3K themselves who get pinned um, by LIJ and then the titles are on them. But then the story is like, oh, you know, Desperado and Kanemaru claim, well, hey, you didn't pin us, even though they actually did pin them in the uh, the junior, the super junior tag tournament. But then they're like, hey, Shingo and Bushi, we challenge you because you only pinned Rapongi 3K. And in the row two shows, there were some, there were like a few storylines. So the first was that in their singles matches, which was, I believe, Bushi versus Desperado and Kanemaru versus Shingo, um, both of those matches ended in DQ victories for the LIJ members because Bushi, sorry, Des- why do I, I keep wanting to call Desperado Bushi? I guess that's just because they're both luchadors. I guess I'm racist like that. I'm, I'm racist against um, masked uh, wrestlers, also known as luchadors. But anyways, the story was that the Suzuki Gun members, they were always getting too into themselves, being like, you know what, this is a throwaway singles match. I don't care if I win this. I'm just going to try and flick pain on pain on you in uh, in the lead up to our title match. So they ended up getting involved in each other's matches, both of their members, and uh, costing costing themselves the matches, but you know, able to do some damage. Um, they ended up working over both Bushi and Shingo's ankles, but I think they're only really... Uh, continued here with Shingo because in this match he sold his ankle you know um, very well and he was even selling it at the end of the show when uh, spoilers when the all, all of LIJ came out to celebrate with Naito for his title victory so and I saw some people wondering like hey does that mean that um Shingo's injury is legit but um Shingo's been a he's been a professional since what like 2005 um I I'm, I I would just be inclined to say that's probably just some generally good selling where he's like I was just in this ring an hour ago maybe it would be cool if I just sold the leg a bit more but um yeah so th- that was a story leading in here um one thing that was instantly worth noting I'm not sure if cage match has this correct because maybe it's just because this match blew by so quickly but I don't think it went the 18 minutes that I see it listed as on cage match but um I can't be bothered going back and uh, checking it, you know, timing for myself. But even if it, it definitely went at least, I'd say maybe 15 minutes, and you compare that to the six minutes that the Wrestle Kingdom main event got. Sorry, the, not the Wrestle Kingdom match wasn't the bloody main event. Imagine that. Imagine a six minute Wrestle Kingdom main event. They probably did that during the Enochism days, I'd say. Like, I bet you, if you look from like 2000 to 2004, there's probably like at least, like, there's probably one six minute main event, I bet. There's probably people that would like that as well. Anyways, yeah, so it's interesting that. Is it just because this was a, a straightforward two versus two that they decided to give this, I guess, more respect? New Japan decided to say, hey, you guys can actually go out and you get time to deliver because the six minute two versus two versus two match at Wrestle Kingdom, that barely deserved a rating. Like, I think I would have given that like maybe two and a half stars. Like, it was barely good. And that was just because Shingo looked like a beast. Um, so, yeah, this match actually got some time and it ended up being good. I, for a while, like, I used to be really down on Desperado and Kanemaru, but then I realized they're actually really good juniors overall. They always have good matches. They usually work their interference angles. Like, they usually work them at a good pace, which matches with their actual um, execution of exchanges. So it usually doesn't feel too jarring, even if it is annoying from a writing perspective. So, yeah, I ended up enjoying their performances. Um, We've got a lot of solid exchanges right away. 
Um, Bushi and Shingo, they were able to work over Desperado and Kanemaru respectively for a while, but eventually Suzuki-gun gained control. We got a brief brawl around the arena, which obviously I'm not a, not a fan of, but we quickly uh, rem moved back to the ring, and from then on, this this was just totally the, the Shingo show, and I went back and I wasn't sure, like, hmm, should I actually rate this match three and a half stars, which is of what my ultimate rating for it is, by the way, because I was like, did anyone else actually do anything like that impressive? And on, on rewatch, I realized, yes, they did. Like, everyone here was really solid, especially Kanemaru, who I'm usually really down on. Like, I usually don't like his work at all, but I thought he worked really well against Shingo here. And the reason I thought that only Shingo was the one working was just because Shingo stood out so much. And it's not that anyone else was bad, he was just great. You know, it's, it's awesome, because whenever Shingo tags in, the crowd always pops. And it's like, he's only been here since, what, October? So he's been here two, three, like just over three months or is it four months? Whatever. He's only been here like less than half a year and he's already getting like the biggest pops um, out of the, out of all four, out of all four wrestlers in the ring. That's awesome to see and he totally deserves it because he is just a destroyer. I feel like I use that term a lot. I wouldn't say he's a monster because he's not like a big guy. He's only like 5'10", but he is just so fucking beastly, you know, destroys people with um, strikes and power moves. And he's also just got a crazy pace, obviously, that he had to um, learn from his Dragon Gate days where their, their main events are just everyone fucking running in, you know, car crash into car crash. So it was great just seeing that. Um, what I really enjoyed was that, as I, as I said, everyone else looked good. So Kanemaru, his, he was the other highlight of this match because the I'd say the final like half of the match was basically him and Shingo going at each other. And we know that Shingo's a beast, but Kanemaru sort of has that, uh, I want to say experience edge, yeah, yeah, I'd say experience huge because he's probably he's probably got like an extra eight years or so on Shingo in terms of in ring experience, and um he was really pushing Shingo to the limits. And obviously Kanemaru is way smaller than Shingo. Like it's almost embarrassing when they stand up against each other. Like Kanemaru, he looks like a junior, and Shingo genuinely just looks like a heavyweight. And again, people have been saying when he's gonna when is he gonna move to heavyweight? Hopefully um after the Super Juniors, I'd say that'd be awesome. You know, give him a showing there, but then have him be like nah, I'm moving up, and he does the G one or something. That would be awesome. Anyways, my point was, Kanemaru, he can't match up to Shingo in terms of power and strength. So he has to rely on, like, sort of, um, you know, little tricks and agility. And um, Shingo, obviously, he's he's well-equipped to dealing with agile wrestlers from Dragon Gate. So they had some really impressive chemistry, and Kanemaru just took him to his limit, got some really close near falls, um, you know... He, he Kanemaru does have some impressive moves once he gets going, and even when he has matches that I consider boring, at least from the perspective of his performance, he always has some really cool moves, and here, they just all worked well. Bushi and Desperado, they were also good. They didn't get as much time to shine, but I really did like the end, because what we had was... There was, a, there was actually a really awkward moment where Desperado introduced a chair into the match and he went after Shingo and the crowd was bracing. Like you could see everyone's breath was held when they saw Desperado. It's like, what's Desperado going to do to Shingo with his chair? And then he lifted it up and he went to use it, but instead he ended up jabbing Shingo in the chest with it as opposed to actually swinging it down full force. And then Bushi attacked Desperado. He got the chair. The entire thing was really awkward, but it ended up with Kanemaru trying to mist Bushi just as had happened on the first night um, tag match between the teams, I believe. But this time, Bushi, he held up the chair which he'd taken from Desperado, which took the entire brunt of the whiskey, and then he misted Kanemaru. And that was an awesome moment because that's like a great use of pace. Like that's, you know, a great theater execution where you've got that one, you know, very shocking moment where it's, you know, Kanemaru's whiskey blow, and there's the, the, the shock of that being used as well as the exact moment where Bushi lifts up the chair to block it, and the crowd goes, oh! And then there's an even awesomer moment, which happens right afterwards, where Bushi responds with a mist, and then the crowd jumps up even higher. So you go, oh, ah! So that was a great moment. I love that. And from there, it's just um, it's just Shingo destroying Kanemaru. So Kanemaru, he's just been misted. He's a sitting duck. He takes the pumping bomber. He somehow still survives. Um, but then I believe it was maybe I feel like it was one more big strike from Shingo. I don't think he used the last of the dragon here. Or maybe he did. I can't remember. Either way, he used some beastly offense. You know, I know I always use beastly. It's another, it's another crutch word. I'll get over it. But um, yeah, he used that. He put Kanemaru away. Um, this ended up being a good match. Three and a half stars. Um, I'm wondering where we go from here with, with Shingo and Bushi because are we gonna go right back to Rapongi 3K because that just seems so boring. You know, Rapongi 3K weren't even on these uh shows. I'm not sure where they were. I wonder if they had a tour somewhere else, or if they were in, like, Mexico or something. I don't think they're on the New Beginning in the USA shows.
But um, yeah, because it would be boring if they just went right back to them. But they really have no other tag teams. It's literally just those three. You know, before it was just Bushi and Hiromu and then the Suzuki Gun team and the Rapongi 3K team. There just needs to be new blood in this junior tag division, you know? Because I don't know how many more variants on the LIJ versus Suzuki Gun versus Rapongi 3K uh, formula I can take. Like, I was already bored of the Rapongi 3K versus Suzuki Gun Juniors tag matches from last year because we saw that, what, like four times or something? Like, New Japan, just bring in some juniors, like some Gaijin juniors, you know, put them together, or just start forming a team with, like, um, God, are there, any, are there actually any other, uh, what about Taguchi? Put Taguchi with someone, you know? Or maybe, maybe fucking pro promote some young lines, you know? Who cares about giving them an extension? Sorry, an extension as if it's a fucking, like, a university essay or something. Um, you know, don't, who cares about giving them an excursion? Just team them with Taguchi, give them the junior tag titles, have them reign for 800 days. That's what I want to see. No, but seriously, we do need some more junior tag teams i don't want to see another fucking oh god if it's another three-way like another like five minute three-way between all the three teams that'd be awful anyways um i'm ending this negatively or even though this was actually a good match like i said three and a half stars let's move on to the next match another tag match for the iwgp heavyweight tag titles this was sonata and evil defending against suzuki and saber what was cool here was that, just like in the main event with Tai Chi, the sort of background going into this match was that Suzuki was really annoyed at being left off the main card of the Wrestle Kingdom show. Because he's been, like, whenever he's been at Wrestle Kingdom, he's been featured quite heavily, you know? He's been in the main event, he's been in, like, a, you know, like some special singles matches, that sort of thing. But in, in this recent Wrestle Kingdom, Wrestle Kingdom 13, he was only in the gauntlet um, uh, kickoff match. And they, they I couldn't tell the translations because you know I don't speak Nihongo I don't know what they were saying but I could tell by context that like Suzuki was saying you know it's embarrassing that I'm in this match with all these geeks and I'm not you know challenging for a title or something so that was sort of his motivation here he was going to claim um you know the the tag titles with his um his like little apprentice Saber um so yeah this ended up being yet another good match um at the start Sonata and Evil got control but eventually Suzuki Gun being Suzuki Gun they ended up gaining control themselves there was a pretty fun beatdown administered by Suzuki and Saber. There was a bit of an arena brawl, and God, I'm not going to go on about, you know, complaining about arena brawls again. You already know my thoughts. Um, again, it was relatively, well, actually, I was going to say it was relatively quick, but I, was, I meant to say it was harmless, because it was quite long. Like, it was probably like two minutes or whatever the usual time is. It feels like 10 minutes, but um, they, they went back into the ring, and it was good. Um, again, because of this match formula, this was able to prohibit the worst parts of Saber. And by that, I mean, because he's teaming with Suzuki, this match can't just be 90% Saber um, destroying someone with holds in, you know, totally ridiculous um, comical ways because he has to tag out and he has to give, you know, fan favorite Suzuki some time to shine. And so that ended up creating the structure where it's these two submission specialists and I guess I guess also strike aficionados if, I, if, I, if we're going there, um, working over one of the allied J guys at a time. I think it was usually... I was going to say I think it was usually Sonata, but no, I think I worked. I think they worked them over both. It's sort of you know 50-50, sort of equal distribution of um of damage. I think Saber would appreciate that equal dis distribution there. Um, so yeah, that was that was enjoyable. I really liked when when they went for the um dual submission spots. They didn't do that as much as I feared. I honestly thought this match was going to be like the majority of them, like eighty percent, was going to be Suzuki and Saber putting both of um the LIJ champs in ridiculous holds and both of them having to get to the ropes or something. And luckily they only did that a few moments and that just made it more important, you know, more cool when they finally brought them out because it felt so rare. Um, it was really cool watching Evil and Sonata fight back because we'd already seen on the singles matches from the previous night that Sonata could to some extent keep up with Suzuki and we'd already seen that Evil could in fact beat Saber despite having a long losing streak against him. So they looked really dominant when they finally came back and started, you know, firing back. Um, Sonata got to show off his, you know, impressive grappling, his his decent um, acrobatics, I guess, you know, moves off the top rope. Evil was beastly once again. He's actually been growing on me these last, like, like these last few shows, especially the singles match the night before and this match. Before then, I was really turned off by his... I've always been turned off by his Grim Reaper gimmick, and I always try to skip through his entrance, because not only does it take long as fuck, but it's also just so cheesy with, you know, the makeup and the scythe and the lights out and the, the what is it, the green and red lights that come from his fingers. That's just so stupid, but he really is like a great... Um, like sort of Ishi Shibata, you know, never open weight ish um, wrestler. You know, he's just got some very big strikes, big power moves. He's a beastly dude. You know, again using the word beastly, but you know, he's a big dude with with big hits. That's what I like to see. 
one thing I don't I don't like about him is his selling. And I'm not sure it's just because he's so good at his role, which is basically being a heel, you know, being a bruiser. But whenever he sells, he sounds it sounds really fake. You know, he goes like, ah. Well, it's not like, actually, no, he's more like, sorry, that was way too high pitched. That was, I'll, I'll give a better impression. He's more like, ugh. And, you know, that's him when he's trying to sell. And I guess that doesn't really work when Suzuki's working him over because it doesn't come off as sympathetic as opposed to someone being like, ah. Again, what is what even is this podcast? I'm giving him impressions of um, yells from wrestlers to try to explain what I mean. But I, I guess I just mean his vocalizations come off as way too gruff and he, he just sounds uh, way too manly, I guess, to um, for it to be believable when he's being worked over. Or at least it, even if it is believable, it's jarring, I guess. Again, always using the word jarring. Seeing someone who's, you know, supposedly this, you know, grim reaper, big dude, being worked over you know it, I don't feel much sympathy for him when he's being worked over as opposed to Sonata who once again has some really good selling you know but you know that's just not where Evil excels as I said he excels with um just delivering the offense as opposed to taking it and uh he was really good here once again just like in his match with Sabre again as is sadly a common occurrence in all of Suzuki's big matches these last few years there's a moment where he gets to apply a submission hold and he applies it for like like a whole minute maybe like a there have been matches where he's applied it for like three straight minutes, but um, here I think it was literally just like only 60 seconds, and again, using only and just 60 seconds in a very um, loose uh, way, you know, not accurately reflecting how ridiculous it felt, because he locked Sonata in a knee bar, and I like I appreciated all the selling from Sonata, because as I said, Sonata has some, you know, very strong selling, but again, it's just, why do you... What, New Japan, why do you do this? You know, we live in the era where we watch MMA. We know that a submission hold, if it doesn't submit someone within like five seconds of being appropriately applied, they're either going to go to sleep or their limbs are going to break. Why do you have to do the stupid shit where Suzuki, the supposed submission master, is applying a hold for like a minute and unable to tap someone out? It's been an issue for well over like two years, but at least the match didn't end there because I really didn't want Suzuki and Sabre to win the titles. I really wanted LIJ to have a decent run. So luckily that's not what happened. We ended up having um, a very hype finishing stretch. So there was a moment when uh, Sabre and Suzuki, they were going for their dual pile drivers where, um, you know, like got, uh, Suzuki's going for the gotch pile driver and Sabre is going for his, what is it, the Sabre driver. And they did that to both Evil and Sonata in their tag match on the New Year's Dash show, which they also referenced in the uh, pre-match video package and so they, they went for that again but this time evil and sonata managed to counter and they lifted both of them uh both of evil and suzuki up onto their respective shoulders and hit moves from there um from there we just got some pretty big moves back and forth um sonata and evil ended up hitting a great magic killer and then sonata hit the rounding moonsault on suzuki for the win so there you go sonata gets his win back from the previous night and it was suzuki who ate the fall and it's important to notice that they didn't have Sabre eat the fall, obviously. They had him lose it the previous night, but that wasn't a big deal because that's only, you know, singles. You know, there's, there's got to be, it's 50-50 chance. I, I hate when WWE says that where it's like, oh, here's Brock Lesnar going up against an eight-month-old child. It's a 50-50 shot. Uh, who's going to win? Because there's two of them. And, you know, that's 50%. But it really was, you know, in, in, in tag matches, when, if you have a, a better option for someone to take the fall new japan does not choose to have sabre ever take the fall and it's pretty big that they have that suzuki is the one taking the fall here because i know it had to be either one of them if they wanted to keep lij the champs but suzuki is still like he's like a top eight guy in, in new japan you know they can rely on him for um a main event here and there but i guess they really are just serious on building up sabre so you know it doesn't matter that like who cares that he dropped the fall to evil in the one-on-one -on -one match because he already had like a he was already like 8-0 against Evil in their tag matches in terms of always pinning him. So he lost that fall there, and um, he, he saved from taking the fall here. And yeah, so that was cool. Um, Again, this match really made me wish for a Sonata singles push. And we've we've all been wanting that for a while. There's a few people sort of got off that train of wanting a Sonata singles push because he was so stoic and characterless and emotionless for so long but it's matches like this where he's up against a way more dominant sort of bruiser opponent such as Suzuki and also Sabre to not really a bruiser but you know someone who's always in control where he gets the chance to sell a lot and actually show the like the actual passion of his character like we finally see oh Sonata is someone who actually cares about wrestling he's not just a guy who goes into the ring and does wrestling moves or I guess no I, I wouldn't say he's someone who we think oh he cares about wrestling it's like wow well, this guy actually has emotions just in general it's like wow well, this guy actually does feel pain he actually does does show desperation and again 
I, I know he's he's shown that in like the G1 when he has pure one-on-one -on -one matches, but it's really only up against a totally dominant opponent where he's forced to have to sell like crazy. And that's where he really becomes like an appealing wrestler to me. And look, let's just give him a decent New Japan Cup run. Like maybe he makes it through to the semifinals or something. Please, I would really appreciate that. All in all, good match, three and a half stars. I believe on the, I think it's on the Osaka show, or maybe it's on one of the Road 2 shows, I noticed that Evil and Sonata are going to be facing Yoshida and Amino. Uh, I, I believe that's still correct at the time that I'm recording this. I don't think the cards have changed, and I don't think I've misread that. Uh, yeah, I don't think I've misread that. But look, I know it's not going to happen. Now listen to me, there's a 99.5% chance this doesn't happen. But imagine if Amino and Yoshida somehow pulled up a win over Suzuki and, sorry, over Sonata and Evil and ended up earning themselves a title shot. Again, I know that's not going to happen, but that will be so cool. I'd be so for that, you know? Like, I know the idea is you always have the young lions being weak and you always protect your solid mainstay guys who've been with the company for, you know, X amount of years or who are already um, proven stars. But I would love that. Just once, just once have a young lion get a big upset over over a, um, you know, a main roster guy. Just have all the interference or, you know, um, shenanigans. Well, not, not shenanigans. You don't want to use, like, you know, illegal interference. But, you know, have, like, the distraction roll up or whatever. Just have it. Just give us that great moment of a young lion managing to pin a main, you know, sort of, you know, B-grade wrestler. That would be awesome. Anyways, let's get on to the divisive main event of the second night of the New Beginning in Sapporo show. This was Naito versus Taichi, and I have seen a wide variety of opinions on this. Um, I saw... Some people saying this is typical Tai Chi bullshit, you know, this is why we never got on the Tai Chi train because he always brings this sort of nonsense. And then there were other people who, like me, really enjoyed the story that was told. So, going into this match, the story was that Tai Chi, he was, unlike Suzuki, um, he didn't he didn't even get a, a, minor sh a minor spot on Wrestle Kingdom. He was totally off the show. And, th like, they showed him at home watching the Wrestle Kingdom show on um, New Japan World and being, like, really depressed about that. And so his motivation coming into this match was sort of that he was he wasn't really caring about the title itself he wasn't really worried about winning the match he was more worried about making a spectacle and making people remember Tai Chi because he was off the biggest show of the year so he wanted these people in Sapporo to know who he was so how's he going to do that he is going to ruin the main event or at least he attempted to now this was a very weird angle and I went through a roller coaster of emotions. Not to say it was super traumatic, but you know, I went through like, oh, do I hate this? Do I love this? Because, and I, I didn't understand the the words at the time when Tai Chi was explaining. Like they were showing a cut back to like an 80s match and Reason JP, which is Chris Charlton, he explained how apparently in the 80s there was a match involving like Fujiwara, uh, Choshu and Fujinami, I think. And it was some combination of them. One of them attacked the other on the way to the main event. And that ended up having the main event cancelled. And apparently that event also happened in Sapporo those, what, 30 or 40 years ago. So Tai Chi, he referenced that in this match where as Naito is making his way to the ring, Azuka, who, as we already know, has been getting himself DQ'd on these shows by attacking people illegally with you know chairs and whatever he also attacked Naito on his way to the ring and this was a crazy drawn out angle where Azuka is just pushing the chair into Naito's throat after already knocking him down for ages and the young lions and like the other people are all trying to get Azuka off for ages and at one moment it felt like they were like as everyone was frozen in, in place for like a full 10 seconds while Naito was just being crushed and then, I, I can't remember what happened, I think Taichi also then took Naito out on the ramp and he hit the Black Mephisto, which is sort of like a, a reverse neck, neck breaker, I think, you know, that sort of move. And then they had the ring doctor come out and everyone's looking over Naito and what happens is Naito ends up being laid out for like five minutes and all this time Taichi's parading around being like, hey, the main event's over, main event's over, go home, you know, and he's totally happy with himself and you could tell, as I said, this is not about the match to him. This isn't about the title. This is about making people remember Tai Chi so that he's not forgotten about as he was on the Wrestle Kingdom show. And then it looked like the young Lions were going to piggyback Naito to the ring, but they actually turned as they got to the like main area and they went out another ramp and took him to the back. And so I want to say this entire angle, it lasted, I think it would have lasted at least 10 minutes, but it felt like, like fucking 15 minutes. 
And I guess it's only like an extra five minutes. Like, oh, wow, Lewis, you thought it was 10 minutes, but it was five minutes longer. But look, that's a long time in, in wrestling time, okay? Like when you're trying to watch a main event and you end up being held up for like 10 minutes, that takes a while. And so we, everyone was really confused. Like not just the Japanese fans, because they, like this got great heat for Tai Chi. Like he's parading around, you know, as I said, he's telling people to go home. He's so happy with himself and that everyone's booing him. Even, even... The, we got the return of the Tai Chi wo Kai Rei, you know, the Tai Chi go home chant, which has usually been drowned out by people saying, you know, let's go Tai Chi. But this time people were like, no, this motherfucker Tai Chi, he ruined our main event. Even if we wanted to see him in this match, he took that away from us. So now we hate him. And even on Reddit, I was on the, um, I was on the squared circle, you know, watch along thread and people were saying like, holy shit, did Naito actually get injured in this angle? And they're just stalling for time trying to figure out what to do because it was an unusually long time that they spent with this injury angle. And that made me think, like, either the match itself was totally going to be cancelled, which is why they were taking up some time, because, you know, it's a big angle, so they've got to sort of draw it out to make it more significant that Taichi took Naito out. Or I was also thinking, hey, maybe, maybe Naito did actually, in fact, get injured in this faux injury angle. But luckily, Naito ends up finally drudging his way back to the ring, and we end up getting a match. And so, what did I think of this injury angle? I thought it was fucking awesome. I, even though I was annoyed with it at times, and I was at times I was really annoyed at how confused I was, being like, what the hell is happening? In retrospective, with Naito eventually coming back to the ring, I thought this was awesome. With the story of Naito, you know, it's, it's a very basic story. You know, Babyface gets injured, fights through the injury, and comes back for his match against the, um, the intentions of the heel. But I just thought that was an awesome setup. And then in the match, it's all about Naito, who's a total star, working through his injuries, trying to, trying to get back at this, you know, this dastardly fucking Taichi who tried to, you know, injure him, you know, illegally, all this bullshit, and every time Naito hit a big move, the crowd erupted. Like, as Naito made his way back to the ring, the crowd, which was already mostly pro Naito, they were even more crazy for him. Every time Naito got offense in, they loved it. Every time Taichi got some offense in, they fucking hated it. They booed like crazy. What also added to this match, at least for me, was that there was already a big fear of Tai Chi winning the title from Naito here because people were saying oh well Naito he's probably going to be in the Wrestle Kingdom main event uh, next year he's probably got to lose this title at some point why not give it to Tai Chi and I I myself like knowing how New Japan respects the IC title it's obviously not on the exact same level as the heavyweight title but they do, it is their second most important title they're not just going to give it to some random you know C or D grade wrestler like, like Tai Chi but here when they had Naito totally laid out and they had him working through his injuries in the match, I was thinking, holy shit, they're going to have Tai Chi beat Naito, and Naito would still be somewhat protected, because the, the argument would be, oh, well, he was so badly injured beforehand, that if Tai Chi hadn't done that, then Naito obviously would have beaten him. And I was also considering maybe this would end in a ref stoppage, you know, where if Tai Chi just continued beating Naito down, then maybe Red Shoes would have to step in and be like, you know what, okay, match is over, Tai Chi is the winner. So that was constantly in the back of my mind, where I was like, holy shit, Tai Chi might actually win this so I didn't think that was going to happen going into this match but then I was like holy shit they've got me and what the the pivotal moment in this match was when Taichi brought out the table and he brought Naito onto apron onto the apron and though he was going to try put him through it but Naito somehow managed to avoid his all of his attempts and he ended up pile driving Taichi through the table and that was what even the match Naito used all of his momentum in that one moment to put Taichi through the table and that evened it out so then Taichi's just been dropped on his head threw a table off the apron to the floor. So he has been quite rattled. And if that had gone differently, if Naito had been the one to eat that uh, to eat that pile driver or whatever other move um, Taichi was going to uh, intend to throw at Naito through the table, then surely that probably would have been it for Naito. That would have been lights out for him. So I also bought on that move from that, that spot the entirety because I was like, holy shit, Naito is going to die. Then it's like, holy shit, it's even again. Naito has a fighting chance. From there, Naito just continued to control um, Taichi with all of his, you know, strong selling. It, it felt like he did sort of drop the selling towards the end of the match, but at that point, it had been going so long where it's like, okay, Naito, you could, I understand you dropping your, your leg and arm um, sort of selling and grabbing your neck. I'm not going to hold it against you because the first, like, 10 minutes or so um, of this match when he's he's finally, like, back in it and, and facing Taichi, the, the, that was when he was doing some really strong selling. And um, it, it added a lot because, as I said, the, the fans are going crazy for all of his big offense moves, but they're also being drawn in, just like I was. I was being drawn into every time he delivered a big move. It took so much out of him because his entire body has just been, you know, um, like destroyed by Azuka and Taichi, illegally, I, I should say. And now, every time he delivers a big move, it takes more out of him. After that table spot, 
um, that both guys just basically remained in the ring for the rest of the match. And from there, we just got the sort of general big match New Japan formula, which, and not to say that because it's a formula, it's bad. In fact, I actually thought it was very good. You know, great power moves from both guys, uh, very strong chemistry and some very strong near falls. Again, what I really love about Taichi's big matches is he goes hard. You know, he's like, okay, this is New Japan. I can't just wrestle my bullshit. I need to bring out the big stuff. And so he brings out the Kawada tribute moves. He was bringing out the Kawada kicks, the stretch plum, the, the dangerous backdrop, and even the Garmin Gary, which I always love. And his style is so different from Kawada. You know, like Kawada was like a total bruiser. You know, he was a big match wrestler. And Tai Chi, obviously, when he's actually wrestling, he can be a sort of big match wrestler, but in a totally different way. But even then, him hitting these Kawada moves, it just felt so right, you know? Like, he was hitting everything with perfect technique. And it's like, dude, if you hadn't had, if you hadn't fucking cheated on your wife or whoever it was and been docked pay by New Japan and had to become a heel in order to continue being a wrestler and not have people totally hate your guts, you probably would have been like a sort of a Naito-esque wrestler who, because you have such crazy athleticism and agility, you could have been, you could, again, you could have been on Naito's level as a performer. Because people don't realize that. Tai Chi is a great wrestler, okay? They just, they just don't respect... Uh, tai Chi. Anyways, um, he, he got in those moves, but Naito, he, he remained in control for a bit, and there was a moment where Naito, he was reaching for the title because he's going to use that against Tai Chi, but instead he chose to put it down, and he went instead for Tai Chi's mic stand. And if you remember their match from last year, I can't remember when it was, but they had a singles match in New Japan. They also had one on Tai Chi's um, produce show, but there, in the New Japan match, Naito also grabbed the mic stand, and he busted it over Tai Chi's head, and so that's obviously what Naito was trying to go for this time as well, but this time, Tai Chi, he like ran into Naito and sort of grabbed around his leg, and was sort of like, you know, groveling, being like, no, please, don't hit me, don't hit me, and that was a comedy moment, but you could, it was a comedy moment, but you could also tell that this was Tai Chi trying to be strategic and being like, you know, no, don't hit me, in order to distract Naito, and then he ended up using, I think, the chair um, or something, he, he took Naito out, and I was thinking there, look, this was another moment with um, we were focusing on Naito and the title. This time he chose not to have the title. He chose to use the mic stand instead. And I knew as soon as he did that, that's going to come back to bite him. And when that happened, I also thought, holy shit, this could be foreshadowing a loss here because then the story would be he didn't trust the heart of the IC belt or whatever the hell. And that's, that's why he ended up losing. But luckily he ended up obviously getting the win and it th didn't just end there. You know, we didn't end up with a one month um, Naito title reign, which would have been pretty disappointing for me. Um, we got some, we got some more fun exchanges as Naito was desperate to put Tai Chi away. Um, he he hit the running Destino, and I fucking hate the running Destino. It's annoying because it looks way better than the normal Destino, but it never finishes a match, and it's annoying because the commentators and the audiences always bite on it, and I'm always like, you idiots! You know the running Destino never finishes a match. It's like Okada's um, non ripcord Rainmaker, where he just has wrist control, but he doesn't do the sort of you know, like ballroom dancing, throw the opponent out, you know, that sort of thing. I don't know how to describe it. The, the ripcord thing. He doesn't do that. But at least with Okada, he never goes for the pin immediately after a non-ripcord Rainmaker. Whereas Naito always goes for a near fall after the running Destino, and it never works. So I just can't buy into that. Anyways, another great moment was when Naito pushed Red Shoes away, and as he pushed Red Shoes away, and Red Shoes, you know, uh, his body turns away, Naito low blows Taichi. And so that's sort of payback for all of the, you know, all the shenanigans and bullshit that Tai Chi's put Naito through. So Naito is being like, hey, listen, dickhead, you fucking remember that I'm, I'm the ungovernable one, you know? I'm the true heel of this company. I'm the guy who, who does bad shit, okay? Don't you fucking forget it. That's sort of what it was like in their singles match in New Japan last year as well, where I remember Tai Chi doing his bullshit all throughout, and then Naito at the end cheating, probably even low-blowing him there as well, and also using the mic stand, as I said. So, um, yeah, I always like that when Naito sort of reestablishes himself as being like, you know, the the ally you know the ally j guy the the ungovernable the destino guy where he's like hey don't don't fucking forget i'm a badass and i'll do whatever it takes to win just as much as you will another awesome moment was when naito reversed um taichi taichi was going for he had him up on his shoulders and then naito reversed it into reverse frankensteiner and then he had like a reverse like like an elevated reverse ddt or like an inward flosion sort of move and uh then he finally put him away with the destino and taichi taichi must have been watching some fucking um uh, tapes of Ibushi and Omega, or maybe even Naito himself, because he took that bump right on his fucking neck, and it just looked fucking brilliant, you know? I always think back to Ibushi and Omega's bumps um, when taking the Destino, and I, I thought, hey, Taichi, you, you were fucking on their level, mate. That was some good shit. So, yeah, I thought this was a low-tier great match. I, I'd give this between 
three and three quarter stars to four stars, you know, in that range. This was this was match of the weekend for me from the New, New Beginning and Sapporo shows. I thought this was an awesome match. I understand it being divisive because I can understand people saying, oh, this is Tai Chi, tai chi shenanigans. But I thought this was so different because like who does a 10, 15 minute long pre-match injury angle? You know, because that genuinely had me going like, at first I was like, oh, okay, Naito is going to return. But then it's like five minutes on. Okay, where's, where's Naito? 10 minutes on. Seriously, where the fuck is Naito? Then it's like, whatever, 15 minutes or however long it was. At the end, I was like, holy shit, they're finally bringing him back. And that just felt so unique. Like, I can't remember New Japan doing anything um, like this in recent years. So that really helped the story for me because this was a story match, you know? But there was also great athleticism, you know, great interactions between them once the match finally began. I saw people complaining about how this match buried Tai Chi, and their argument is, Tai Chi, he did all this damage to Naito, but then he looks like an idiot because he didn't immediately pin him. And my argument there, as I've already explained, is Tai Chi doesn't really care about the title. There was even some, there were even some references directly to that, like symbolically, and this sounds like, oh, a New Japan fan is going to be artsy-fartsy about some, you know, deep ghetto booking lore, but it's like, it's true. If you look on the Row 2 shows, um, there were some moments where Tai Chi, he would reach for the IC title, but then he would throw it away, and I believe it was on the tag match the previous night, that's when he did it. He looked like he was going to use it against Naito or against someone in the ring but then he chose to throw it outside and that's him showing hey I don't care for this title if he cared about the title he wouldn't have just thrown it so um no freely and after that match he took the title with him but he put it on one of the stage hands shoulders and he walked away from it that's also him showing he doesn't care about it if he was going for the angle of walking off with the belt if he cared for it he probably would have walked away with it to the back but instead he gave it to some random dude showing that he doesn't respect it he's he doesn't care about this guy not being a wrestler and just being there to work the cameras or whatever he put the title on him, which, you know, in kayfabe would be disrespectful to the title and to the company. So the story was never, oh, Taichi really wants to win this match. The, the, the story for Taichi was, he wants to make an impact and make a scene. He wants people to remember who Taichi was, because they didn't get a chance to remember who he was at Wrestle Kingdom. He was there to make a scene. Okay, and that's what he did with his attack. And he was he was perfectly content to not have the match go. As we saw, he was saying, hey, main event's over, main event's over, after it was clear that Naito wasn't immediately going to um, come to the ring and um, fight him after after Azuka's attack and after Taichi's extended attack as well. He, did, he just didn't care. This was totally personal. And when he saw Naito come back for the match, he was like, oh, okay, cool. I can I can inflict more damage on him. He, he was not a guy who cares about the title. So people saying that this makes him look like an idiot because he didn't win the title it's like yeah that's his character he did not care about the title so why are you calling him an idiot because he didn't achieve something that he never wanted to achieve also people were just if they weren't making that criticism they were complaining about how tai chi did, did all this damage and then he still couldn't win the match so even if you say oh well yeah maybe you can say he doesn't care about the title but surely he still wants to win the match Again, I wouldn't really consider this a criticism. It's more like pointing out the characteristic of Tai Chi, which is that he is like he is dangerous as hell because he's so sneaky and tactical with all of his bullshit, you know, the, the interference and illegal attacks. But he is he is fucking dumb to the extent that he is so in love with himself and so desperate to be the center of attention that that impacts his wrestling. And look, if you want to say, well, yeah, I can't get into someone like that. Like, you can justify it, Lewis, but I don't care about someone like that. Then, hey, you know, don't care about him. He's only like a C-grade wrestler in New Japan. He's not like an Ibushi where you have to, ex to, for some ex to ex some extent, um, care about their motivations, you know? It's Tai Chi, and I'm not saying, oh, anyone who's not a main eventer, we don't need to care about their character. I'm just saying, do we really care about having such a flawed character when they're only like a C-grade wrestler? You know, because as I said, the story was he's just trying to make he's just trying to make an impact, you know, be remembered, make a spectacle. Who cares if he really doesn't get protected? And again, the point here was we want to protect Naito because Naito is a massive is a massive star. And even then, it wouldn't have made sense in non wrestling terms in non kayfabe terms to have Naito lose here just because he got a big beat down. Like I know in real terms, that would make sense. Like if a guy got jumped before his match and then fought, obviously he would lose. But the non kayfabe story here was that Naito is a big star, which I guess does relate to um, kayfabe as well, because in kayfabe, Naito is one of the strongest wrestlers in New Japan, uh, despite what some people think. So he was going to it was going to take more than a simple. Um, onslaught you know more than a simple onslaught to take Naito out and that was the story he fought against all odds and he came back and I do feel like the same people who will complain about Tai Chi being protected were also the same people arguing six months ago about Naito being not being protected because it's like Naito just withstood a total a total onslaught of an attack and he managed to come out on top you know that's Naito being protected who cares if Tai Chi who's a C-grade wrestler who's 
barely barely on the on the radar for New Japan. Who cares if he looks like a geek coming away from this? This was just a filler title defense as far as I was concerned, at least going into this match. Who cares if Taichi looks a bit stupid? It, it plays into his character and he still gave a really good performance. And hey, he doesn't look like a geek because he proved just how dangerous he is because he incapacitated Naito for like a full 15 minutes. And even once the, the match started, he had really limited Naito's um, offense. So that's like walking away from this match. I don't think Naito, um, Taichi is a geek at all. I think, wow, he's a guy who has some dangerous options at hand. He just doesn't know how to use them. And I guess that's the story going forward, you know. If if in um, a year's time, Taichi's done absolutely nothing, then hey, maybe then you can say this was a terrible match. This was the, this was the turning point where Taichi totally jumped the shark. But let's give it time. And this match as a whole, I enjoyed it. I thought that Taichi was awesome. I thought Naito was awesome. I love the story of Naito being such a I guess such a massive force that he couldn't be put down just by the admittedly big onslaught he, I'm always using the term onslaught, he couldn't just be put down by the massive attack that Izuka and Taichi had administered, he was smart enough to know exactly how to pace himself in the ring in order to regain some control, he knew how to fight back, he, he knew exactly, he had his wits about him to avoid Taichi's bigger moves, and he ended up getting the win, and he got to stand tall with his boys at the end, you know, low tier, great match, um, it's, I guess it's my first like, great match of February, and yeah, it was awesome having the rest of LIJ come out, obviously we were all expecting Hiromu to come out, and we didn't get that, that was disappointing, it's like, damn, when are we going to get Hiromu back, I hope we fucking have him back in time for Best of the Super Juniors, that's my um, one hope, but um, yeah, Hiromu, come home, we miss you. In the post-match as LIJ and Naito were celebrating, LIJ gave a, sorry, Naito got the, 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 uh, collective of LIJ gave a promo, no, Naito, he gave a promo, and he mentioned one thing that was very interesting, he said that while he is IC champion, he will hold, or at least challenge for the IWGP heavyweight uh, championship as well, and that got me really hyped, because when I've been like fantasy booking in my head, you know, making my own little notes in my notebook, I've always loved the idea of Naito being a double champion, you know, IC champion and IWGP heavyweight champion, because that would sort of be the payoff to him not winning at Wrestle Kingdom 12, it would be like, hey, in two years time, you're a double champion, and you get a decent run out of that, but I don't think this is going to happen, because obviously he's teasing this for the New Japan Cup, I guess implying there that he's going to be entering, or else why else would he randomly say, hey, I'm going to be a, a double champion, so I guess that's implying he's going to enter himself in there um i don't think he's going to win he probably even won't make it to the finals i imagine he's probably going to drop a fall to someone during that tournament maybe in the semi-finals and then that will set up a future um defense of the ic title for him um i do still think he's going to be main eventing wrestle kingdom 14 i have no idea how we get the title off him i am just difficult with i i, I just can't predict new japan and especially naito i have no idea how New Japan books Naito, like what their thinking is, like if they don't have him main event Wrestle Kingdom next year and win, I'm going to be like, okay, yeah, New Japan just doesn't see um, what they have in Naito, and that'll be disappointing, because when he when he lost at Wrestle Kingdom 12, I was like, wow, shocked, but I was still excited to see where things go, and I was like, you know, Naito's still got time, but if he doesn't win next Wrestle Kingdom, who knows what the hell's happening. So, um, yeah, no idea what the future holds for Naito. Hopefully he just continues having great matches, um, continues raising the, the level of the IC title. Maybe we see some uh, further development with him getting attached to the title. Who knows? Let's see what happens, eh? All right, guys, that brings me to the end of, what is this, episode seven? Six or seven, it'll say in the title. And uh, that's the end of the New Beginning in Sapporo day one and two reviews. Um, uh, if this was like one single show, if you could somehow ignore having um, double matches with Suzuki and Saber and Evil and Sonata, um, this would have been like a full-on like good show. I'd say these these shows are more like sort of six out of tens, just because it's that it's a totally boring um, undercard. You know, the, the last three matches of both shows have been good. Um, uh, actually, I think I'd say for the second night, this is probably like a seven out of ten, like a like a strictly good show. The first night, I'd probably give like a six out of ten. wasn't super strong in it. Again, it's annoying with New Japan undercards being so uneventful. Like, they don't even really progress any stories, at least any interesting stories. Um, you know, we had the we had the stuff with Tamatonga, which is occasionally fun, a bit annoying. Um, we had the stuff with, like, Taichi and Ishimori sort of being progressed. But it was really the last three matches on both nights that appealed to us. So we'll just quickly go through those. We'll compare with the um, cage match ratings. So on night one, 
there was Suzuki defeating Sonata. The cage match rating is 7.26. That's pretty much equal to what I gave it. I gave it uh, three and a half stars. Evil defeating Zack Sabre Jr. has got 7.37. Again, I gave that three and a half stars. Then there's um, Fale and Jay White versus, well, defeating Tanahashi and Okada. That's got uh, 7.03, and I gave that three and a quarter to three and a half stars, so that's even. Then on the second night show, there's LIJ, Bushi, and Shingo de defeating Suzuki Gun, Desperado, and Kanemaru, and that's got a 7.95. I was surprised at that being uh, so high, but I guess it's just because other people like me are really into Shingo, but I wasn't into it as much as saying it was basically an eight out of 10. I gave it a three and a half. I also gave Evil and Sonata versus Suzuki and Saber as being three and a half, but that doesn't even have a match guide listing, so I'm, I'm surprised on that. And then there was my match of the night, my match of the two shows as well. Naito defeating Taichi, which I gave three and a quarter to four stars, you know, a low tier great match. And this has a very conflicted 6.33 rating. I guess this just continues the streak of Naito being the one who's most likely to have disappointing main events. And by that, I'm not blaming him. It's more just, you know, his matches with Suzuki, even going back to like um the match with uh, Jay Lethal. That one random time, that was also like a, a disappointing main event. So yeah, but I thought this was a great match. So yeah, I'd recommend this match. Who cares if other people don't? You know, my opinion is what matters most more than other people's. So yeah, check out this match. If you don't go into it with the um, expectations that it's going to be a bunch of bullshit, if you just appreciate it for uh, what it is, like you say, okay, this is the story they're telling. They're going to tell the story of Taichi being way too into himself, you know, being a bit stupid and Naito being courageous and having to fight through a massive injury. If we're going, if you just appreciate that, hey, that's the story that's being told, I think you'll be able to enjoy the the, the match overall. And I think you'll, you'll realize, hey, there actually is some pretty good great wrestling exchanges in here that, that help it out. So yeah, um, that was my match of the show. If I had to give a wrestler of the two shows, I almost want to say Jay White, just because I thought he was great in for his, his general performance in both matches. But I think I just have to go with um, Naito, just because he gave a great baby, baby face, you know, selling performance um, in that main event against Tai Chi. He worked a very unique formula. I thought he did very well. So yeah, that, that's my recommendation. All right, this is the very finishing uh, section of this episode. Just looking forward to things that are coming up. So uh, in terms of reviews, uh, again, I'm going to be doing a preview for the, I think I'm, I'm going to say that I'm going to do a preview for the Osaka show because I feel like I could keep that to like 30 minutes and it won't be too much of a hassle to record and edit. Um, I'm definitely going to be doing a review of the New Beginning and Osaka show as well. There are also going to be two Dragon Gate shows. There's, the, the, there's a show tomorrow night and there's also going to be uh, a show like a week's time I think around the same time as the new beginning in Osaka show and I'm going to be reviewing those as well um, I also plan on releasing a top 10 matches of January thing which was suggested to me by one of one of my more well, I was, was going to say fans it sounds a bit up myself you know as if hey I'm a, I've got fans but I'm you know by by some guy who enjoyed the content and I think he reached out to me on Twitter on um Reddit and he was like hey you should do a top like matches of um the month so I think I'll do that I've just got to watch a bunch of matches um just to make sure I haven't missed out on anything where people would say oh how could you not include that so um yeah that's going to come as well I know there's also a Noah show that I think's being released I think in a few days time um that we had a title match between Kiyomiya def uh, defending against Ketamiya so I'm probably going to be uh, reviewing that as long as it's not like a random Nico Nico show because those are really difficult for me to watch but um yeah just stay tuned to the uh, channel you can find me on Twitter at puregradepuro again so that's puregrade p-u-r-o they won't give me the last four letters for pro res that's annoying you can find the show on YouTube Podbean and iTunes just search puregrade pro res um hey the show's still quite small I've got like maybe like five consistent fans, it seems like, or I guess like five people who are constantly downloading the show. Um, shout out to them. Look, if you have like any uh, opinion on what I've said, or you just want to ask me a question, or just let me know that I'm dumb as fuck, or I've got some uh, very smart, very handsome opinions, let me know. Comment on whatever um, forum or whatever, uh, you know, whatever way you're accessing the show, whether it's YouTube, Reddit, whatever, just comment. Let me know your opinions. I love the discussion. Um, leave a like and, you know, all that bullshit if you think I've deserved it, if you think it's worthwhile. Um, yeah, I'll see you guys next time. Thanks for checking this out. Peace. Later. I'll see you all later. Peace. Goodbye, everyone. I'll see you later. Peace. I'll see you later. Bye. Bye, everyone. Peace. Goodbye.